week four of What Happy Couples Know. What Happy Couples Know. So good morning, welcome. If you're joining us online, glad you're here with us. Um, if you're here in person, love you guys. You guys are all rock stars. You look great when I can't see you in the light. I'm just that's so messed up. I'm sorry. Yeah, just kidding. Anyway, so again, we're in the last week of What Happy Couples Know. And for the last three weeks, we've been trying to answer this question. What do happy couples know, right? Um, and, and what happy couples know is that our hopes, dreams, and desires can quickly become and start feeling like expectations, right? Happy couples know that hopes, dreams, and desires can quickly become expectations, right? And that they also know that happy couples also know that they decide that they owe each other everything, but they are owed nothing in return, right? We talked about that in week one. In week two, we talked about that the entire thing, happy couples know that the entire relationship is a submission competition. It's actually a race to the back of the line. It's all about who can go first at being last, right? And then last week, we talked about happy couples know sometimes, sometimes you got to throw things, which is why we don't have a box anymore, because we threw it. We tossed it, we flung it, we got rid of it, right? And if that makes no sense to you, go back to our website, mynewday.church, and you can watch it, and that'll make sense to you, right? That hopes, dreams, and desires that are not getting met, when they're not getting met, and you have these feelings and these emotions because your hopes, dreams, and desires aren't getting met, that we are to cast, we are to fling, we are to hurl all those unmet hopes, dreams, and desires on God, not on our partner. And all the emotions that go with it, we hurl, cast that stuff onto God. We don't cast it onto our partners, our significant others, right? So they know, happy couples also know one other thing. They know that they have a choice. Happy couples know they have a choice. Today, I want to talk about that choice that every coupled person makes. Whether you're married, married again, single again, single, it doesn't matter. Any kind of relationship you're in, you make this choice, okay? And everybody makes this, this, this decision, whether you're aware of it, or you're not, right? But it's oftentimes more, feels more like a reaction than a decision. But it's, uh, so the point of today's message is I want to point out a decision that you're already making, but perhaps you, you, you didn't know you were making, but perhaps can help you make better decisions, right? Most people don't feel like they have a choice, but here's the thing, you do, they do, right? And happy couples make what we're going to call the happy choice, all right, who wants to be happy, right? And, and, what, and what is the choice that happy couples make that they don't know they're making, but that makes all the difference in their relationship? What is that choice? And the answer, answer to that question is found in the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the, to, um, to the city of Corinth, right? He wrote a letter um, to the primary Gentile um, population in the city of Corinth, the non-Jewish, that's all a Gentile is, it's somebody that wasn't Jewish, a non-Gentile, new Christians that were trying to sort this whole Christian thing out in the city of Corinth. So Paul sums up in this primary Gentile environment, he's going, okay, look, this God that I've introduced to you is completely different. This God actually cares about his people, that he cares about his creation. So consequently, in order to please this God, it's not about sacrifices as you think about it, because in their culture it was in order to appease the gods, you made sacrifices. You made the gods happy by sacrificing. What they sacrificed was crazy. People, animals, money, they made sacrifices. But what Paul was saying, it's not about the sacrifices the way that you think about it, but in order to please our God, the God that I've introduced you to, the God Jehovah, you actually treat people the way that God treats people. That is that you are to love the people around you. And Paul introduces this idea that Jesus actually uh, originally introduced in, of this horizontal versus vertical religion, right? Horizontal religion says, hey, I'm going to treat you, I'm going to love you the way that Christ loved me. I'm going to treat you the way God loved me, right? The old version was, I'm going to treat you, I'm going to treat God, I'm going to treat God the way God wants to be treated so God will be happy with me. Okay, big difference, right? Then the Apostle Paul had just spent several chapters in this letter explaining, okay, if you want to kind of do the whole religious vertical thing, knock yourself out, but that's fine. But don't forget, the way you treat people really is the number one manifestation on how much love God, is how much you love God and how much you respect what God has called you to do, okay? 
So in this particular chapter of 1 Corinthians, um, he explains it. Now, this is a very popular chapter, and um, some of you actually had some of this or maybe used some of this at your wedding. Um, some of you have probably even quoted some of this in your marriage vows, um, or you read about it, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's really what I want my relationship like. It's 1 Corinthians 13, which is often called the what? Love, Love chapter, right? Okay. But when you really understand what the Apostle Paul is doing, as I just explained, this really isn't great wedding literature. It's not really great wedding stuff, right? Because of the way that he shows it, but because of the way that it shows up in our English Bible, it, it, it just, it makes it easy and we make it wedding stuff, right? But this stuff is actually really earthy. It's very gritty and, it, and most of it makes sense, but there's one line in this chapter that when I read it and when I study it, it did, just didn't make sense to me. That in this one line is the secret to the decision of the choice that happy couples make. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what may seem like familiar verses and words that you've heard before. And then we're going to get to this one line that doesn't make any sense, right? And we're going to camp out on that line for a few minutes, and we're going to talk about it, right? So we're going to pick it up, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If you speak in the tongues of man or of angels, but do not have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So now he's just finished telling them, look, because in their religion, they would have, in the pagan religion, they would have these ecstatic utterances, and they would speak in other languages, or they would try to think that they were speaking in other languages. They would literally try to speak the language of their gods or speak the language of the angels. So he just finished telling them, okay, if you would like a version of that to be part of your religious experience, that's fine. But don't kid yourself. That's not the main thing. Even if you actually were able to tap into the language of angels and of God, but you do not have love, you're nothing but a loud noise. Now, this verse, I'm going to get a little personal for a second. This verse, to me, is a great reminder that you should never judge somebody like me, a preacher or a speaker or a teacher, you should never judge someone like me who does what I do based on, based on my speaking skills or my knowledge of the Bible, right? Because speaking skills and knowledge are talents that someone can develop. Just like you have talents that you've developed. If you really want to know what kind of person I am, if you really want to know what kind of Christian I am, you need to talk to that woman right there. You need to talk to my, my kids, you need to talk to my friends because the talent, a talent or ability isn't necessarily a manifestation of my spirituality or my faith. Love is always the bottom line. So he goes on. He says, if I had the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge and I have faith that can move mountains but I do not have love. I love you too, Addison. I know, I'm doing great, thanks. Um, sorry, I love her, she's cute. Um, it, it, but I do not have love, I am nothing. Literally, in the Greek text, Paul says, if I am the smartest person in the room, and I can explain anything in the Bible, and I can answer any question you have, and I don't have love, whatever it means to have love, Whatever, okay. I'm nobody. Which is another great lesson for another day. Because Paul, what Paul's saying here, knowledge, knowledge doesn't equal deep. Knowledge doesn't equal deep. If you want to meet somebody who is deep, who is a deep Christian and deeply spiritual, knowledge is not the measure. Love is the measure. Amen. He says this then. He says, if I give all my possessions, who would do that? right? He says, it's not 10%. It's not 20%. If I gave all my possessions to the poor and gave my body to hardship that I might boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. What Paul's saying here, here in this verse, he's saying anybody who gives to get gets nothing from God. Anybody who gives to get gets nothing from God. Anybody who gives to gain, gains nothing. That's what he's saying here, right? Again, that's another teaching for another day. But here's the question. What is have love? 
Like, I got to have love. He said it in all three of these. What, I'm not sure, but I bet you if we did a survey right now, and I were to ask all of you in here, how many of you have love? Everybody like, have love? I, I have love. I have love. I don't know what that means, but I have it. <laughs> right? Because when you hear this phrase, have love, it just sounds like something that's inside, doesn't it? Right? Like, I have love. And maybe the apostle thought, well, they're going to think this is some kind of internal thing, some kind of feeling. Like, I feel compassionate towards people. Or I feel compassionate or I have feelings, love towards those people going through that hard time. Like, I feel sorry for those children. I feel sorry for that couple. I, I feel bad for whoever's going through that. Like, I have love. So Paul wants to make it clear to these first century ex-pagan Christians, this is not an internal thing. This is not a vertical you and God thing. This is a very practical, horizontal thing. So he gets really practical, and he says, when you have love, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about stuff you do. Love, the kind of have love I'm talking about is love is patient. So Paul goes right back to the putting the other person first ideal here. Patience is simply saying, okay, instead of moving at my pace, instead of moving at the pace that I want to move at, I'm going to slow down and move at your pace. You first. Love is kind. A better word here is love defers. Love defers. Even though I know what I know, and I know what you know, I'm going to defer to you versus looking to me. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love isn't jealous. Like, when you're, when you're thinking, oh, God, you're so much more talented than me. You get all the attention. You're the life of the party. You got the joke, and I didn't get it. Oh, wait, you're telling the joke, and I don't get to tell the joke. You stole my line. Love is, does not envy. It's not jealous. It does not boast. This is, this is great. Like, love doesn't try to one-up and shut up the other person. Love doesn't say, hey, you thought you, you had a great story? Let me tell you my story. Love says, no, 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 I'm going to let you shine. I'm going to let you take center stage. I'm going to let you get all the attention. I'm going to let it stay all on you. I'm not going to rob you of that. I just, I don't envy and I don't boast, and I'm not going to boast about it. Like, love is not proud. This is probably one of my favorite ones. Like, love does not dishonor others. In other words, love, love decides if this if this thing that I'm about to do dishonors you, I'm not going to do that. If there's something that might dishonor you from me, that's a sin. And I would be sinning against you. That's what it means to dishonor you. That's what it means to cause somebody regret. If you cause regret in somebody's life, and we all have regrets, that's, showing, that's dishonoring somebody, right? Right? And whether you can find a verse or not that says, yes, you can do it, if it dishonors the other person, it's off limits. It's not, it's not okay, right? It's not self-seeking. Again, back of the line, back of the line. This is the less self thing to do. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It doesn't have a temper. It keeps no record of wrong. Who could do that, Paul? Paul? Wouldn't it be great to be in a relationship where they don't keep no records of wrong? With somebody that could be like, no big deal. Then Paul says something, <laughs> it would be great, right? But then Paul says something that eh, kind of a little tricky, and we're going to come back to it in a minute, but it's a little tricky when you read it. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. Okay, okay, we'll come back to that. And then he's like, then he kind of goes forward and he kind of gives you this rapid fire things of what love is. And he says, it's love is always protects. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Now, one of these things, if you're paying attention, should kind of bother you because one of these things doesn't make any sense out of the other, out of all four of them. And the reason it doesn't make any sense is one of these things is, isn't completely dependent on you. It's kind of dependent on the other person in the relationship. And the thing that's kind of odd, the one that kind of sticks out when you read it, is this one right here. Always trust. Because that has nothing to do with you, right? And that's kind of stupid. Like, 
can, you, can we be that naive to always trust? I can always protect a person, even if they're wrong. I can always hope that things will get better. And I can persevere, which sounds like there's going to be struggles and there's going to be troubles, but I can push through that, but always trust? Like in the, in the Greek, this literally means to always believes or believes everything. Like, really? Is that even possible? That love defaults to trust. And here's the thing. This is a keystone happy, a habit for happy couples. This is a keystone habit for happy couples. Let me illustrate it to you this way, because... What? Right? In every relationship, every, and I'm talking business relationships, and I'm not just talking romantic, marriage, dating, engaged. I'm talking every relationship that you are ever in, family relationships, business relationships, every relationship. From time to time, there's going to be a gap between what we expect someone to do, because, right, he said, I'll be there at six, I'll pick you up, I'll pick up the kids. I'll have dinner ready for you. I'll, I'll make sure that I tell him. I'll make sure that I tell her. My wife gets that one away. I'll make sure that I tell her, and then I never tell her because I'm great at not telling stuff, right? There, there's what we expect, and then there's what we experience, okay? The graphic's a little big. Our TVs are being a little goofy, but that's what it is. So on one side, it's what we expect, and then on the other side, it's what we experience. And there's a gap between those two things. In every relationship from time to time, there's a gap between what we expect and what we experience. And here's the thing. Every single time, this is a choice that we have to make. Right? Thank you. That was beautiful timing. Thank you so much, Frank. <laughs> Ding! Light bulb just went off in somebody's head, right? <laughs> but often... <laughs> I don't know why they let me over here, okay? Oftentimes, we don't even realize that, right? We don't even, in fact, most of the times, we don't realize we're making a choice because it feels more like a response. It feels more like a reaction. But every time there's a gap between what we were told somebody was going to do and what they led us to believe they were going to do and what they actually did, whenever there's a gap, Whenever things don't line up, we choose what we put in the gap. We choose either to believe the best. I don't know why. I don't know why he's late. I don't know why she didn't. I don't know why they didn't follow through. But you know what? I'm sure there's a good explanation. And when I get all the information, it's going to make sense. It, you believe the best. Or... We assume the worst. She did it again. He did it again. I knew, I knew, I just knew, right? That, that just, I knew, I could expect it, I knew. That's how it always happens. But happy couples know, happy couples make it a habit to believe the best. To believe the best. That's what it means to believe all things. It's a choice. In the moment, it doesn't feel like you have a choice, right? But every single time there's a gap between what I was told, what I was led to believe, what I was promised, every time there's a gap that, that, that between what I was told and what, I, what actually I experienced, he didn't come through, she, did, she was late again, I don't know where he is, I don't know what happened, I, I don't know why. It's like every time there's a gap, every time there's a gap, we make a choice as what to put here. And happy couples choose to believe the best until we just can't believe it anymore. And this is a keystone happy for, a habit for happy couples. Let me explain it to you this way, okay? And a book that was written by Marcus Buckingham called The One Thing You Need to Know, okay? This is a book about business management and leadership um, and making process, uh, progress, okay? In this book, they make an amazing point that is the point that I'm trying to make here, Okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this as a reference, okay? And in this book, he cited a 20-year study, 
okay? So over 20 years, a group studied happy couples. They studied happy couples in the U.S., in Canada, in Europe, and as they looked, and, and they were looking for, as you might expect, what the common denominator was in these happy couples. Now, when I say happy couples, these weren't, um, these were couples that had gone the distance. They had been married for a certain number of time, a certain amount of time, and they enjoyed each other's company. <laughs> Let that sink in. They enjoyed each other's company, okay? They were not couples who were just grunting it out. They were staying together before the kids. They were miserable, but they couldn't afford to separate, right? Not those couples. That's not the couples they were checking out, right? So when they went into this study, they had assumptions, right? Because that's what you do when you're doing a study. You have assumptions. And one of the assumptions was, in fact, this was their primary assumption, was they expected that to find that they would find couples who had gone the distance, who had bumps along the ways, but they were still loved each other and enjoyed being together, they assumed they would find that over time, these couples had downgraded their expectations of the other person as it relates to their motives, to their character, and to their virtue. In other words, that over time, they'd realize, you know what? He's not as great as I thought he was. She's not as great as I thought he was. So I'm just going to lower my expectations, and I'm going to have a more realistic view of my husband or my wife. And so consequently, consequently, they were able to stay together. Here's the most interesting thing about this study. This study showed the complete opposite. That happy couples, <laughs> happy couples rate each other more positively in every quality that their partner has, then they rate themselves. Or in other words, they had an unrealistic, positive view of their partner. Their findings was that, that love, love is actually blind. <laughs> they were blind to their spouse's deficiencies. Amen. And this positive illusion created what they called an upward spiral of love. And you're going, what in the world does that mean? What is an upward spiral of love? Let me tell you this. This is what they showed. That the illusion, he's the greatest, she's the greatest, created conviction. They believed it for so long, they actually really believed it. No, he really is the greatest. No, she really is the greatest. Right? And then that conviction would lead to security because they are the greatest. I feel secure in my relationship. I trust them. And that security led to high levels of trust, which we know high levels of trust leads to intimacy because you know what intimacy is? Intimacy is a fearless reveal. Intimacy is I trust you. I trust all of me to you, and I don't want to hold anything back from you because I feel I can trust all of me to you. That's what intimacy is. So security fosters intimacy, and intimacy fosters love. And you know what the love did? Love fed the illusion, which created more conviction, which created more security, which fostered more greater and deeper intimacy, which fostered and created deeper and greater love, which fed the illusion. You all see what happens there? It spirals. It's like the opposite of the crazy cycle, which means nothing to you unless you've been through love and respect. But this is quite literally the opposite of the crazy cycle. So at the end of this 20-year study... Here was their recommendation. Now, they took this, they applied it to a business concept. I'm taking it, and I'm applying it to what happy couples know, right? That to become a happy couple, you find the most generous explanation for each other's behavior and believe it. That whenever there's a gap between what I expect and what I experience, come up with the most generous explanation for the other person's behavior and just decide to believe it. Believe all things. 
always believe, choose to believe the best. Now, obviously, there are things that this is that challenge this and make this difficult. And I'm not, 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 I'm not naive to believe that there aren't obstacles. But regardless of the obstacles, which we're going to talk about those in a second, right? B- regardless of the obstacles, I don't want you to miss that point, this point, that every single time there's a gap, every single time there's a gap, when it comes to that gap, even if it's the same gap over and over and over again, every single time when, when, when what you place in that gap is what you decide to place there, whether it's you, you, what, you know, and, and whether you believe the best or you assume the worst, that, but whatever is in that gap, that is your decision. It's a choice that you have made. And I don't want you to miss that as we wrap up this series. The, the, the gap, that's your choice. Now here's, there are a couple obstacles to this, right? And here's, one of the obstacles is this, is, is what we experience. What we experience. And I mean, yeah, but he did it again. She did it again. It's like clockwork. The other, the other obstacle that, that we bring to the relationship is who we are, right? Because let's be honest, we didn't show up on our relationship as a blank slate. We showed up in our relationship with all of our stuff, all of our baggage, all of my father wounds, my mother wounds, my grandfather, grandparents wounds, my older brother or my older sibling wounds, oh, the just so you know wounds, my former boss wounds. Oh, that boyfriend that I stayed with way too long wounds. Or that girlfriend I stayed with way too long wounds, right? It, like, I just found out that I was one of three siblings, but I was the only one they kept. Wounds. Like, all of these wounds. We bring that stuff with us into the relationship. So, so many people just have a difficult time trusting other people. Because we bring our history, we bring our baggage, we bring our fears, we bring our insecurities. And because of that, there are certain behaviors that trigger certain responses in all of us. We can't help that. But here's what I want you to hear. Even with all of that junk, even with all the stuff that you bring into the relationship, even with all the inconsistencies of the person you're in a relationship with, that you, that the way that you love that you're in a relationship with, that every single time, every single time, it's a choice. It's a choice. So I'm going to dig for a minute. I'm going I'm to make us uncomfortable because I like doing that. So, and I've been doing the marriage thing long enough, not as long as some, but long enough to know that, that suspicion, suspicion is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you assume the worst long enough for enough time, eventually, I promise you, eventually, you will find something. You will actually find something to be suspicious about, and here's why. Because when you're in a relationship with a person that has low trust, you're on pins and needles all the time. When you're in a relationship with a person that you feel like he's kind of, she's kind of looking for you to do the wrong thing, you're never going to be at ease. You're always going to be off balance. You're always going to be careful. You're always going to be cautious. You're always going to be controlled in your behaviors. And and your words that will appear, the words that you speak will appear as if you're up to something, even if you're not. And it won't even be your fault. If you have low trust because of your past, if you have low trust because of previous private relationships, when you bring that into a, re- a relationship, you may accidentally create an environment in the relationship that sets the other person up to do the very thing you're afraid they're going to do. That they have no intention of doing. But suspicion and low trust in a relationship is always a self-fulfilling prophecy. It sets the stage for the very thing that you fear most. That's why you need to pay attention to who you are and not just what the other person is doing. Now, both of these things, both of these objections, these obstacles, they're important. But it's so much easier, isn't it? It's so much easier to do these, to focus on these things than to focus on, to focus on what they said, to focus on what they did as opposed to who you are in the relationship, right? Because, but again, even with all of that junk, 
you still get to choose. You still get to choose. So with all of that in mind, there's a hair in my eye. And all of that set up, I want to go back and look at two verses that we went through really quickly. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 6 and 7. Pick it up in verse 6. Okay, ready? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. You know what that means? Love isn't trying to catch the other person doing something wrong. Love isn't building a case against the other person. Right? They're not trying to say, they're not trying to set something up so that when they step into that trap that you've laid for them, oh, you did it. Oh, you said it. You did it again. You said it again. Love does not keep score of the past. That is what that's saying. Again. Instead, love always protects. Protects from what? Love always protects the relationship from suspicion. Love always protects the relationship from lack of trust. Love protects the relationship. Love always trusts. Love chooses to trust, chooses to believe the best, chooses a generous explanation to fill the gap every single time. Then he says, love always hopes. You know what this means? Love trends positive. I'm not going to allow myself to go negative in my relationship. Love trends positive. Love always perseveres. And again, the word perseveres, as I said earlier, indicates that or applies resistance. That there may be some doubt, that there may be some negative, that there may be something from the past that comes up roaring into your future. But love decides, you know what? I'm going to persevere. I'm not going to give in to that trend. I'm not going to create an environment in my, this relationship. I'm not going to create that kind of environment in my home that basically sets up the other person to fail and fall into the trap that I've laid for them because of my expectations. Love is determined to trust always. And it is determined to trust anyways. So do you believe the best? Do you make the choice? Do you make that choice all the time? Do you fill the gap with the most generous explanation? Or do you assume the worst? Do you immediately go negative? Do you go internal and look at your, exp uh, your experiences? Happy couples know it's a choice. And that it's your choice every single time. And I know, but she, but he, but he, but she. No matter your objection, it's still your choice. But he, but no, nope. still your choice. And here's the thing, the other option, the other option certainly won't move the relationship further. Here's option B. Delight in uncovering mistakes. Thrive on suspicion. Assume the worst and embrace doubt. Can you imagine sitting down with your, your kids, your future kids, your kids now, your kids that are getting ready to get married? Can you imagine sitting down with them and they're asking you for a marriage advice, uh, marriage advice on how to have a successful marriage, moving into marriage, or, you know, whatever, that permanent relationship? And you're like, all right, I'm going to give you some advice. You want to know what? Here's my advice. Basically, honey, lay a trap. Wait. And then, then you can say when they step into your trap, I knew it. I knew you were going to do it. Just lay the trap. Just be always looking out for the stuff. Always be piecing together the whole kind of formula. Work it out in your mind. That way when they step in your trap, you can be like, gotcha. No, that is not what you're going to tell your kids. You would say, you know what? When there's gaps, and there's going to be gaps, there's always going to be gaps, that you get to decide what you put in the gap. And you're always going to come up better if the habit, if the pattern in the relationship is to believe the best. Always going to come out better if your habit is to believe the best, to trust always. So now, 
your homework assignment. As we're wrapping up this series on what happy couples know, your homework assignment. For those who are coupled, okay, you can apply this to any relationship. As I said, you can go to work and you have that one guy that always shows up late and you just, you, you're you expecting it. You can do this at work as well, okay? But your homework assignment is just to do this for a week. Just decide, even if it's nine times out of 10 and there's no excuse for what he did, what she did, just for a week, decide, you know what? Before I get all the information, before he calls, before we get together tonight, I'm going to come up with the most generous explanation, and I'm going to believe it. I'm going to cho choose to believe my own, uh, my own explanation for his or her behavior, just for a week. Choose trust. Choose trust. Now, trust equals acceptance. When you trust me, that's accepting me. When I trust you, that's accepting you. And if you want to be ex accepted by someone, just communicate the point that I trust you, that I trust you, that I trust you. Because here's the thing. Ultimately, our hearts and ultimately our behaviors are drawn to people that we trust, right? Because isn't this statement true? The people that we want, that, that we are, that the people that you want to let down the least are the people that you respect and admire the most. The people you want to let down the least are the people that you respect and admire the most. And when you create an atmosphere, when you create the pattern of high trust, you create an, an environment of high acceptance. And all of our hearts are drawn towards acceptance, which is why we love Jesus, because he accepted us even when we were sinners. Does this mean that you don't have difficult conversations? No, that would be completely naive as well. Of course you have difficult conversations, especially when it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. So yes, you talk about it. Of course you have to talk about it. But as soon as the conversation is over, you just go right back to believing the best. Because that's the past, and I'm not keeping score, even if it's 10 out of 10 times. Even if there was no good excuse, and this is the 11th time, I'm going to come up with the most generous explanation, and I'm going to choose to believe the best. Because that's what happy couples know, and that's what happy couples do. Because happy couples know, they believe that the best, the, that's the choice to make. It's a choice that they make every single time. They decide to choose. The happy choice. That's what happy couples know. Let's pray. Father, <laughs> we, just, we just thank you that we have these letters that Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was killing Christians and then had this encounter with you that he, we got these letters that he wrote to these churches preserved in a text that we can come back and we can see your heart when it comes to relationships, Father that we could see your heart when it comes to all relationships. Jesus made it very clear that it's one command, to love as I have loved. And then he died on a cross for my sins, for your sins, for our sins. We are to lay down our lives for each other. And then you give, you sent Paul with these, these directions, these practical applications that love is patient, love is kind. It does not boast, it is not envious. That it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. So Father, I just ask that you make this, this come alive in people that are in relationships now, Father. Especially married relationships. That they start today, they start today to trend positive, always hopes, goes positive, doesn't go negative. We ask that your spirit just fill us alive with love, Father, with love to love our enemies. Set a table for me in the midst of my enemies, God. Love our enemies, to love each other the way that you loved us, Father. It's so cliche, but all you need is love. And it's because you first loved us. That while we were yet still sinners, 
You sent a savior. You didn't send a judge. You sent a savior that said, I love you this much. My heavenly father, the father of extravagant love, loves you this much. That I want to be in an intimate, deep relationship with you all the time. And I want the, the byproduct of that relationship to be a pouring out of love the way that I love you. It's out of the abundance that we can love this way. So Father, fill us. Fill us with your heart. Fill us with your joy. Fill us with your love so that we can love the way that you loved, that we can make the happy choice every time because it is a choice every time. It is a choice every time. And I pray that you give us the power and you give us the, the courage, the courage to make the choice every time. In Jesus' name, amen.